Ephesians 6, chapter 10, and the text says this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your full your stand against the devil's schemes. For a struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and have done everything to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel. In addition, call this, take up the shield of faith, which you, you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in, in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the saints. Pray also for me, that when I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fiercely make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I, should, I may declare it fearlessly as I should. It's good to God. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day that you made. We thank you for the blessings you've given us. We thank you for your word, the power of your word. We thank you for this time and the service where we examine your word, and we just pray that you give us that understanding today and to open our eyes and open our minds and open our hearts and open our ears to your truth, to hear, see, believe, and live the truth. God, we love you. We praise you. We praise you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Over the past couple of weeks, we've talked about it one way or the other, but I want to reemphasize it. The church is in a spiritual war. Now, it has been. This is nothing new. The text we're reading here is nearly 2,000 years old. 2,000 years ago, when the church came into existence, on the day of Pentecost, it was entering into a war zone with Satan. And before that, Israel was in a spiritual war with Satan. There are two kingdoms who are at war spiritually in this world, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. And you have to be on one or the other. You can't stay in the middle ground. You have to make a choice. The church is in a spiritual war. The problem is the church doesn't always know it's in a spiritual war. We don't come to church to just be a part of a social club. We don't come to church just to play games. We come to church to be fed the word, to be strengthened, to be able to go back out into this world, to be able to go back out and be able to serve our God and rescue others who are dying in this world because the kingdom of Satan is attacking them. We have to come to this reality. And we have to come prepared and ready for battle. For those of you who were in the military, you know this. He just doesn't enlist you and then send you out to war. You come in and you take the basic training. You learn how to use the things at your disposal, your gun, your, your ammo, and, and everything else that you have. And today, as Christians, we're going to look at how we're able to take our stand and to be able to stand strong against Satan. For if we do not learn how to stand, we will fall, and if we will fall, so will the rest of the world. The church is here by God to help us win the lost. But in order to stand, you have to learn how to stand like a Christian soldier. So that is what we're going to look at. We're going to take a look at who our enemy is. We're going to take an in-depth look at who it is, because sometimes we forget. We're going to take a look at the armor of God and how we should put that on and why it's important. And we're going to learn why we need to take our stand. So let's get right into it, and let's talk about our enemy. Our enemy is real, and he is described in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 through 9. 1 Peter... Chapter 5, verses 8 through 9. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. 
Standing firm in the faith because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. I want us to use this as kind of a, a launch pad to talk about Satan for a little while. First of all, I want us to understand what the problem is in the church. And if you look statistically, the statement is true. Many Christians today do not believe the devil is real. Statistically speaking, nearly a majority of Christians doubt the real existence of Satan. Now, this is a problem. Now, here's my theory on this. You want to know why we doubt the existence of Satan? We don't want to admit that there is real evil in this world. Because that's frightening to think about. But just pretending that something doesn't exist doesn't mean it's less real. You know, sometimes I'll talk to people and, and they're telling me about how bad they're feeling. I say, you need to go to a doctor. They say, I don't want to go to a doctor because they'll tell me there's something wrong. Well, there is something wrong or else you wouldn't be feeling bad. Not finding out doesn't mean it's going to go away. It just means it's going to get worse. <clears throat> In the church, we can understand this. If you believe that there is a heaven, you have to believe there is a hell because the same Savior talked about both. It actually gave with hell a literal illustration. When he was in Israel, he could look at the valley of him. He pulled over there. There was a, a continual fire. It was a dump heap. He says, if you don't obey God, if you don't believe in the kingdom, if you don't turn to God's house, you're going to throw it into there. And he could point to a, a continual smoke pile that Israel knew was real. The same God who tells us that there are angels tells us that there are demons because a demon is a fallen angel. The same God tells us that Satan, or the devil, is real. Pretending he does not exist only hurts you. In fact, I would say this, he wants you to believe he doesn't exist. Okay, this is where I get to be a nerd for a little bit, so just play with me here for a while, all right? Ever watch the first three episodes of Star Wars? Bank of Menace. For those of you shaking your head, no, stick with me, okay? The Phantom Menace and all those. Do you remember the Emperor? None of them knew that it existed. They didn't know where he was at. They didn't know he was the evil guy. He wanted them to know, to believe that. He didn't want them to believe it was real. He didn't want them to believe he was the, uh, the enemy. He didn't want them to believe he was bad. Because that way he could attack. And he did. When you don't believe that Satan is real, all you're doing is giving him an opportunity to attack in your life. So how does the Bible describe him? No one does the Bible describe Satan, a real Satan. They describe him as real dangerous. Peter's text here described him as a roaring lion. So we take Jericho down to the zoo the other day. It was a great adventure, right? And they had this place where you could go and feed a giraffe. And she was able to go up and hand a giraffe. I believe it was lettuce or leaf or something. I don't know. I don't, I don't feed animals, sorry. Mariah did it. <laughs> you notice? She fed a giraffe and not a lion. Why didn't they let her go up and feed the lion? Because lions pound, eat, devour. And that is exactly how God described Satan. Now, he also described him in another way. But you've got to go back to the book of uh, Revelation to see this. Revelation chapter 12. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain, as she was able to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. He swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God, where she would, might be taken care of for 1,260 days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angel fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. 
The great dragon was hurled down. The ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation, the power, and the kingdom of God, and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of brothers, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. They have overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, who were dwell in them. The woe to the earth, the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He, fit, he is filled with fury, because he knows his time is short. When the dragon saw that, the, that he was hurled to the earth, and he pursued the woman who gave birth to the male child. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle, so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert, where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and time and a half, uh, out of the serpent's reach. Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman, and she her away to the torrent. The earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and flowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of the mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey the commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. The problem with Revelation is most people try to figure out things you weren't meant to figure out. So don't do that with this passage. There are some easy things to figure out here. You just got to follow along. Don't get lost to try to figure out what the time, times in the half, or 1,260 days mean. Let's identify what is here. We identify Satan as the dragon as a text us. That's easy. What is Satan doing? He is warring against God. So much so there was even a war in heaven, and he couldn't even defeat Michael, much less God. Michael is the archangel. If you couldn't defeat a, an archangel, how are you going to beat the Son of God? How are you going to beat the Holy Spirit? How are you going to beat God the Father? You're not. That's the answer. He's been defeated. That's the second thing you really learn from here. What's he doing? He came to attack the, the male child, which is identified as Jesus Christ. Multiple times he tried to put him to death before his time. Many times he tried to tempt him. Didn't win. Christ won the victory. Satan is now angry. How angry is he? He wants to destroy those who believe in Christ. But those who believe have already won the victory if they stayed strong. That's the whole point of this text. It's very easy when you try not to figure out every little thing you weren't meant to figure out. You just got to stay focused on what is easy to figure out. Revelation is actually a very practical book if you stay focused. And don't get caught up in things you shouldn't, you're not going to understand until the end of time anyways. The point of the passage I want you to understand here is how dangerous Satan is. How angry he is. How he wants to destroy. This is a warning to the church. If you don't take this warning seriously, dragon can get you. You cannot defend yourself from an enemy you do not know or understand. Oh, sorry. Let's go back. Satan also has his allies in this world who knowingly or unknowingly do his will. I want you to understand this. There's a lot of people doing the will of Satan that don't know that they are. In fact, they're thinking they're doing something for God. This is not in your notes, so write this down. Matthew chapter 16, 22 through 23. I decided to add this text in here just a few minutes ago. Because it shows how even a righteous person can end up doing something wicked because he doesn't understand what he's doing. Matthew 16 is an interesting passage. In this passage, Peter gives the good confession, which we still use today. I believe Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God. It's a statement you make before you're baptized because you are making the statement that you are now accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. This is a key passage. Jesus brags on Peter. Peter, what we as the rest of humans do, head went from this big to this big. <clears throat> and now thought he needed to educate Jesus. Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to die because Jesus knew the will of God. I am going to die. Notice what Peter does here. Matthew 16, start with verse 22. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have the mind of the things of God, but the things of men. 
Peter, who just gave a good confession, was now trying to tempt Jesus not to go do what was necessary for Peter to have forgiveness of sins. Peter didn't know what he was talking about. Peter was going by bad Jewish theology, theology about the Messiah. Theology matters, guys. Doctrine matters. Don't ever let somebody tell you it doesn't, that all churches believe the same thing, or all, all of us do this or that. No, guys. Doctrine matters. It is a key component, and this is an example of it. Peter had bad theology and was tempting Jesus not to go to the cross, which was not from God. If it's not from God, where does it come from? Satan. Which is exactly what Jesus said. Get behind me, Satan. You know, sometimes we look at passages like Jesus being tempted by Satan, we're going to look at that a little bit later, and we don't read the entire text carefully. It said that Satan left him for a more opportune time. It wasn't the only temptations Jesus ever faced. This is one of them. Satan is tempting Jesus not to go through with the will of God because of one of his disciples. Guys, people sometimes knowingly or unknowingly encourage people to do things for Satan. Sometimes they even think they're doing a good thing. Sometimes they even think they're doing the work of God. You've got to know the Word. It is the only thing that prevents us from following Satan. The Word of God. Like the preacher. You can be wrong. You ask my wife, she'll tell you I've been wrong a lot of times in my life. A person can be wrong. The word never is. Got it? Alright. See, I just did that to make sure my wife was paying attention. I, I, I just admit I'm doing wrong. <laughs> You cannot defend yourself from an enemy you do not know or do not understand. Guys, if you don't know who Satan is, if you don't understand the, the work that demons do, you're going to find yourself fighting against the wrong things. Churches will fight against churches. People of God will turn on the people of God. Or we'll try to use other methods other than the ordained by God to win the fight. You know your enemy. You know how to defend yourself from him. So let's go in. How do we now stand against Satan? I want you to understand something in this. I want you to understand that it is possible to stand against Satan. It is possible to stand against Satan. And I have just lost one of my pages, so I need somebody, I need to borrow the book. Frank, we'll get A anyways. I'll give you the answers later, okay? Yeah. Right, thank you. Okay. The Christian is supposed to be uh, supported with the truth. This is key right now. Understand, there's two types of weapons that are used in this world. Truth and lies. Satan uses lies. Look at John chapter 8, starting with verse 42. John chapter 8, starting with verse 42. This is what the text says. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and now I'm here. I have not come on my own. But he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar, the father of lies. <coughs> Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? I am telling the truth. Why don't you believe me? He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not, uh, do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Now, I want you to understand something here. Jesus didn't say, believe the truth that is your truth. See, our world today doesn't believe there's absolute truth and there's absolute lies. They believe there's truth for me, there's truth for you, there's truth for him, there's truth for her. No. There's truth and there's lies. That's it. Satan uses lies. Because he is the father of all lies. He told the original lie in the Garden of Eden. And if you lie, 
You're following him. You understand something? We are sometimes as humans, we do the dumbest things. So we we make a list of really bad sins and sins not so bad. And you ever notice where we always put lying? Lying is always the not so bad sins. Do you realize that almost every group, when 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 God makes a list of sins that sin to hell, lying is almost always in there. More so than a lot of other sins. Because it is directly connected to what Satan does. He's the father of all lies. Which means, when, if we want to stand, we have, it comes here about having the belt of truth. The belt was there to gird them, to strengthen them, to help them to be able to carry things. But to be able to help them to move, you cannot be supported with anything but the truth. You cannot move forward with anything but the truth. The truth is essential. Search for the truth. And God makes it easy to find. Number two. We are to guard our hearts with the righteousness of God. Bless the prayer. It protects the chest. What's behind the chest? It's the heart. In the Bible, the heart is the seat of personality. That's why it keeps talking about your heart. I mean, the heart's just an organ. But what it's talking about is the seat of who you are. We are protected by righteousness, because if not, that's where wickedness comes from. Look at Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15, 16 through 20. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked him. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and out of the body? Whoever comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. These make a man unclean. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what make a man unclean. But eating with unwashed hands does not make him unclean. Now I want you to understand something. We're living in a world where we think we're fighting against actions. Guys, it's reason the church is failing. We're trying to change people's actions instead of the heart. You change the heart, the actions will go with it. You change the actions and the heart's still corrupt, and you just find a new way to sin. If you tell a person, you know what? Whiskey is going to kill you. Quit drinking the whiskey. And they say, you're right. I'm going to switch over to heroin. Do you know why they switch? Because you didn't tell them what to do right. You told them to stop a bad habit. Part of discipleship. Part of rebuking people. Go back and look at John chapter, or excuse me, the John the Baptist message in Luke 3 this week. Do you notice what he did when, when they came to him and said, what shall we do? He didn't just say, stop what you're doing. He would tell them a positive too. Jesus would tell them a positive too. The church has to say, quit doing the evil, but we have to tell them what the righteous is. We have to work on the heart. This is one of the things I've been very convicted by with some of the reading I've done this year when they were talking about how to convert sinners. They keep talking about the problem is if you, we are trying to win people over to an action, we're not trying to win them to Christ. If you want them to quit a bad, dangerous habit, if you want to save their souls, if you want to save their lives, you have to get them to Christ. I don't have the power to break anybody of any sin. Sorry if that's what you believe. I have the power to take you to Christ, and Christ has the power to break the strongholds of sin. Let's start working on people's hearts. And you'll see true repentance come, and when you see true repentance come because of belief, you'll see a true change in life, and you'll see a person be saved. Work on the hearts, guys, because that's what we're told to protect with righteousness. And righteousness is a very simple definition. If you don't know what righteousness means, it's okay. Write this down. Being right with God. That's all it means. Keep it very simple. I, I know I teach college, and I hate theological long definitions. They're dumb. Simplify them. Righteousness. Being right with God. That's all you got to know. You're made right by God by following His Word. We cannot stand without the gospel of peace. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 2. Tomorrow we celebrate our independence from Great Britain. 
While that is something that we should celebrate, guys, I want to tell you what's more to celebrate is our independence from sin, our independence from Satan, and our being brought into the kingdom of God, which is what the gospel of peace does. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you were, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. We involve the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature, and following its desires and thoughts, like the rest, we were by objects of wrath. But because of this great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms of Christ Jesus, in order that in coming ages he might show his incomparable riches of his grace, express the kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Easy definitions. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what it literally means. You can, if you want to, you can start scratching out the word gospel and just put in good news because that's what it literally means. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. How we were rescued from the dominion of hell and sin into the kingdom of God. It is the peace made between us and God. The text says very specifically, when you are lost, you are an object of wrath because you are in your sin. You're in the kingdom of Satan, okay? If you, if you imagine, a few years ago we did uh, uh, Kingdom Chronicles as VBS, and, and sometimes the way that children's material explains the word is the way we still need to do it in church. And they, they had these two kingdoms at war, Satan's and God's. As long as you're in Satan's kingdom, you're an object of wrath of God. You have to come over and be made a citizen into the good kingdom. And if the gospel peace does that, it brings peace between us and God. Do you guys remember back and, and remember the, the account of Christmas? We read it every year, right? And the angels always talk about peace. There's one translation I don't like. It talks about peace on earth. But actually, it's peace on whom God's favor rests. It's a better translation because it captures the idea. When Jesus came into this earth, he brought peace upon those who believe. The peace of God is only made through the blood of Jesus Christ. It is what causes us to be on God's side. Here's what I want you to understand. We cannot stand up to Satan if we are using Satan's methods or tools. Okay. I want you to go back this week and read all those passages we read about Satan again. The first Peter, Revelation, even the Ephesians passage that I want this is your homework for the week. You go back and you concentrate on it. I want you to notice something. Each of those texts say something about being equal, either able to stand, to resist. You are able to resist Satan in your personal life. You are able to resist his influences. But you can't do it using what Satan uses. You have to use what God uses. So let's talk about that. How do we protect ourselves from, from evil then? Protection from evil. Satan uses, you can put it in your lies, you can put it in temptations, whatever you want to put, it's going to be the same thing. And confusion to try to lead us away from God. <coughs> Once heard about Adolf Rupp, he used to say that he used to run the same play at the beginning of every game, and then adjust his strategy according to what the other team did. So you can go into the game knowing that Coach Adolf Rupp was going to do the same thing. I want you to understand something. If you go back and really reread Genesis 3, really focus on it, you will see Satan's methodology that he still uses to this day. I am sick of hearing 
liberal theology that says, did God really say? Because that is exactly what Satan said. It, but look, I understand with somebody who doesn't understand the word, ask that. If you're a preacher, if you're a teacher, if you're a theologian, and you are doubting the word of God, you're doing exactly what Satan did in Genesis 3, because his, his strategy has never changed. Lies, temptation, confusion. Satan's the author of all that. He has literally never changed since Adam and Eve. So what do we do? <laughs> we are shielded by our faith in God. Hebrews chapter 11 is designed to be a passage of encouragement. Look, in order to understand a chapter, sometimes you have to understand it in its context of the entire book. The entire book of Hebrews is simply one book to try to tell Jewish Christians not to leave the faith. They were being tempted to leave the faith and go back into Judaism. So the entire book is saying, don't do that. So when we come to, to Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11 is telling us how the men and women of faith of old, please, not only please God, but overcame. And this is what the text opens up as. Now, read, listen to it carefully. That faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Understand the word hope here for a second. I may say, man, I hope it doesn't rain tonight because I want fireworks. That's not the same thing as what this text means. Hope means a certainty. It's built in. You know what's going to happen. And it's what gives you motivation in life. This is what the ancients were commended for by faith and understanding that the universe was formed at God's command. So what was seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his, of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks even though dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had overtaken him. For before he was taken, he was, commanded, uh, uh, he was commended as one who pleased God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes after him must, be able, must believe he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. The Roman shield, which is what Paul would have used as an illustration here, was a massive shield. It was as big as a door in many instances. It was designed so that a Roman soldier could duck down behind it and cover his entire body. It, was, it had a designation so that when the enemy would shoot flaming arrows, the shield was designed to put out the fire. And it was also designed as they, they lined up, they could build a wall and a ceiling. The front soldiers got together, formed a wall. The rear soldiers all lifted their shields up. It's literally something for you to put your body behind, and that's what faith is. When your faith is strengthened, see, this is why you've got to work faith like a muscle. What happens to a muscle you don't use? It, it withers, it's useless. A person who works up builds up their strength and their muscles. You've got to build up your faith just like you do a muscle. You gotta exercise, that means you've got to exercise it continually. You know, if I, if I go to the gym once a year, I'm not going to look very fit. Which I don't. So you can take a look at me right now and see what happens when you don't exercise, right? But don't do that with your faith. Because it's the only thing that shields you from Satan's attacks. And we're protected with the knowledge of our salvation. A helmet. Soldiers wear helmets. People on motorcycles wear helmets. People who are on construction sites will wear a helmet. You're doing it to protect your head. Now, what's inside the head? This is very simple biology here. It's your brain. It's where you store your knowledge. <coughs> knowledge of your salvation produces a confidence. I want you to look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. The entire book of 1 John is just really John encouraging Christians to know that they are saved. 
Look, I'm not a, a believer of once saved, always saved, once in grace, always grace theology, but I am a believer in the biblical version of that. And you're saved. You can know that you're saved. I, I, I struggle with Christians. And I used to be there at one time. You ask them, if you die today, are you going to heaven? They say, I hope so. But that's a, that's a dangerous, dangerous answer. It's I know. Because when you say, I hope so, Satan sees a foothold. You grab that heel right there. Trip you out. You see, either you believe the promises of God or you don't. You either believe the guarantees of God or you don't. The Christian who has repented of their sins, believed that Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God, confessed Him as their Lord and Savior, been baptized, and has walked with the Lord, if you say, I hope so, you're saying, I don't know if God's going to hold up His end of the Bible. Or you say, my salvation depends upon me and not my God. And that's all Satan needs to trip you up. Guys, if you're following God's path, will God not save you? Do you doubt the guarantee of God? Or do you believe it's all up to you? If you believe it's all up to you, I've got news for you already lost. Because it's not up to you. You cannot do enough good to be saved by God. If you could, Jesus wouldn't have died and we wouldn't be talking about communion. We wouldn't be reading the Word because we could do enough good deeds to cover up the bad thing. You need to be rescued. That knowledge keeps Satan from throwing out a doubt that can crumble your faith. That's why it's the, ship, the, the, the helmet of salvation. You've got to know. This is why John wrote the entire book of 1 John. Not so you can say, I hope so, I guess so. It's because you can tell somebody, I know, because Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Peter repeated by saying, he who repents and is baptized will be saved. We are told in the book of Revelation that he is faithful unto death will be saved. It's not a guess. I already knew who won the war. I just got to remain faithful. Is your I guess because you haven't been faithful? Or because Satan is allowed to throw in enough doubt for you to destroy your faith? It is important that we have the right beliefs and faith in order to stand against Satan. Finally, we're supposed to move forward. We're not meant to be a defensive only soldier. You may say, well, everything looks defensive here. That's because we didn't get to the end. We're at the end now. And we're going to have some offensive weapons because we're supposed to move forward. When you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards. Moving backwards never helps anybody. We have to advance. The, the old Christian song is onward Christian soldier, not backwards Christian retreat. We move forward in this world because Satan can't stand against the church. We can resist him. We can stand against him. But he's like that big old bully that doesn't want you to punch him in the nose. So he intimidates you every which way he can. We are to use the word of God to defeat Satan. I was thinking about this. You know, sometimes one of the challenges with, with a preacher is not to be thinking about your sermon during the service. Sorry, I repent. I did. Matthew chapter 11. Jesus Christ demonstrates through the rest of his ministry. He has the power to cast out any demon he wants. They don't have to fall at his feet. So when he's confronted with Satan, he could have casted him out. He eventually does he does not. I had a question on that. Why is that? Jesus is also a holy man, and he is making this, I believe, as an example for us to show us how Satan can be defeated. Now, I want you to notice this. Matthew chapter 4, start with verse 1. And Jesus was led by the Spirit to the desert to be tempted by the devil. And for fasted 40 days, and four nights he was home. Tempter came to him and says, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Temptation number one. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but in every word that comes from the mouth of God. If you look down into your text here, there should be a little footnote that will tell you that it comes directly out of Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Keep going. 
This is why footnotes in the Bible are important, by the way. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are really the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike a foot against a stone. Now, I want you to notice that Satan is trying to use scripture now. Tell this by your footnote, which says, Psalm 91, 11 and 12. Notice what Jesus answers. Jesus answered him, it is written, also, do not put the Lord your God to the test. But note tells us that's out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in the splendor. All of this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And this tells us that that comes out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. And the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. By the way, the power of even just one book of the word of Jesus here, according to the footnotes, used one book. Didn't have to use the whole. That's how powerful the word is. Guys, do you notice the stuff? Every temptation, every battle of Satan, is not Jesus wrestling him to the ground, you know, putting him in a headlock and making him say, Uncle. It's not him, you know, picking him up and throwing him into the gates of hell. What it is, is him quoting the word of God back to him. That's the power of the word of God is. You want to make Satan flee from you? You want to make Satan move away from you? You want Satan to leave you alone? Know the word of God. Read it. Believe it. Memorize it. Pray it. Dwell on it. If you don't care about Satan's attacks, you have no other offensive weapon that God gave you besides the word of God. By the way, what's the number one thing he's wanting to pull you away from? The Word of God. Your enemy doesn't try to convince you to put down a weapon that he can defeat. He always tries to talk to you about putting down a weapon you can, he cannot outmatch. We are to use the power of prayer to help us stand and to move the gospel forward in this world. I want you to notice something that Jesus talked about here in Matthew chapter 6. We, we sometimes repeat the word Lord's prayer and we don't give a thought to it, which is the exact warning he told us not to do in the verses following. This is how you are to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. <coughs> this is praying about the kingdom. Your will be done. God's kingdom to be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. Help us wrestle with our forgiveness issues. Please all who have forgiven our debts. Let them go. Lead us not to temptation, defeat Satan, but deliver us from the evil one. Paul told us to pray for him so he could speak the word of God fearlessly. When you make yourself able to stand, pray for others, to pray for the advancement of the gospel. And I tell you this much right now, the church is wanting revival, but the church is not praying and fasting for revival. That's why it's not coming. You want revival? Quit complaining about the world. Quit telling me everything that's wrong. Get on your knees, pray, and take time to fast. Pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out word. Pray for him to make you a useful person. Use the word of God in your life. Move the gospel forward. I want to ask you, Christian, are you trying to move the gospel forward in this world? If not, we're retreating. Now, I want you to notice something. The, the Romans did not put anything on the back. And neither did God. Because that's for retreating. We're supposed to move forward together. No retreat, no surrender, no giving up, and no more negativity. I'm tired of the negativity of Christians if they're doing nothing but wailing and moaning about the world. The world's always been bad. Ever since sin came into it, it was only good in the Garden of Eden before sin ever got there. Guys, we got to toughen up. The world is depending upon the church to bring the message of Jesus Christ. We have got to move forward as soldiers and quit crying about the past. Move it forward. We are in a spiritual warfare. Our enemy is real. He wants to devour us. So what are we going to 
do? We gotta sit down and lay down like a defenseless sheep, or we gotta get up and fight. Because we have another lion standing next to us, the lion of Judah. He's bigger and badder. We must have the right mindset to be able to stand, to protect, and to advance. If Christians do not stand, the world will fall to Satan. I want you to dwell on this statement this whole week. If you do not stand as a Christian, your family is going to fall to Satan. If you do not stand as a Christian, your friends are going to fall to Satan. If you are not going to stand, you, your co-workers are going to fall to Satan. Your neighbors are going to fall to Satan. In fact, I want you to look at that sentence right now. Scratch out the word word for a little bit. Put somebody in their personal. Who is in a battle with Satan and losing? If you don't take your stand, their souls depend upon you. That's your responsibility. Every time I get in this pulpit, I understand my awesome responsibility and how I'm going to be judged for every word I just uttered in this sermon. For every sermon I've ever uttered out of my mouth. Because I have an awesome responsibility to deliver the word of God accurately and faithfully, and so do you. So my soul depends upon you. Maybe even be your own. Prepare for the spiritual battle that's ahead. It's here. Whether you want to be in part of the war or not, here. Will you stand? Will you advance? Or will you fall? The good news about this is we don't stand alone. Jesus said in the Great Commission that he's with us always into the very end of the age. Acts 2.38 promises that the Holy Spirit is with us. Do you want Christ? Do you want the Holy Spirit to be your advocate? Do you want to stand in the Father's kingdom? Have you repented of your sins? Confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you walked into the watery grave of baptism? Give us your sins and give the Holy Spirit. Tomorrow is Independence Day from the day of the day your independence from sin. What's your choice? You have a chance to make this. We stand and sing our invitation song today.